welcome to a video. This is a bit sad because yesterday, which is the 6th of June, I received the sad news that my old friend Tony McPhee had died. Tony had not been well since about 2008, I think. When he had a stroke, I organised a benefit for him at the garage, which then was called the TNC2, I think. And Vince Power, who was running at the time, gave it to me for well, I saved it to him for free. And we had Roger Chapman and the shortlist came down. Sorrow blacking out of space upon and a few other people, I, I, and I'm sorry, there's nothing about it online. I, I know we had some really good, good acts and it was quite packed, but um, and I know Tony was very grateful. I first met Tony way back, roughly 1978, 79, something like that. I can't remember how it came about. I think it might have been my friend Joe Pearson, who used to put on shows at the White Line in Putney, before I did, and I think he gave me the contact or whatever, and I um, couldn't believe that Tony McPhee, great British blues guitarist of the era, was playing in a small pub in um, Putney, because, the Groundhogs were very big. I mean, either White Festival, they headline big shows, thousands of people, etc. They were on Top of the Pops doing an album slot where they played Cherry Red and all the teeny boppers. <gasps> were wide-eyed and I was not a teeny bopper at the time, but I was quite wide-eyed because um, Cherry Red, the song, is not something you'd expect to see on Top of the Pops because I think it lasted about six minutes and Tony used to play quite a lot, well he used, to, he used to be one of his signature songs. I mean he was a great guitarist, a great singer, a great songwriter and a very 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 nice chap. He's one of the nicest people I've ever known and it's just a shame that he's been plagued with ill health. Even though he look, used to look after himself, I mean he didn't drink much, he hardly drank at all, he gave up the booze all the time, he was totally vegetarian, much more than me. I mean I um, slipped into things, he'd never have any fish for example, whereas I'm a piscatarian, is that the word? Pescatarian? Pesky piscatarian, that's me. And he wouldn't do any of that, I don't think. I mean, all this is very hazy, because you've got to bear in mind that some of this stuff was way back when. But I digress, do I not? Because I was talking about how we first met. And I'd say it'd be 79, 78, 79, and I was running an agency at the time and doing shows and various other things, and I had an office at Wimbledon Theatre, and the acts I used to look after at the time were, off the top of my head, Gino Washington and the Ram Jam Band. Desmond Decker and the Aces. Are you ready to sing? I can't hear you. Are you ready to sing? All right, now go sing that song, I do. And various other bands, I can't remember all of them. I went to see Tony, he had a, he lived with his wife at the time, Sue, in a terraced house in East London, very near Hackney Marshes. Because I remember we used to go walking in Hackney Marshes and I went to see him and we had a cup of tea. And I think it was, I think it was a flat actually in the house. I really can't remember. Um, he and Sue split up. He said afterwards it's because she um, thought he was boring. And um, so that didn't work. He, he, he then got with the woman he stayed with the rest of his life, which was uh, Joanna. I mean, he basically was a phone engineer then, working for BT, which coincidentally was where he started from when he left school, because he was never academic, he'd be the first person to mention that. But he was very good with electrical things, as I remember. I mean, that's hence working for BT. And he used to, I remember back in the days when he first started playing, he told me that he used to rewire his guitars. I'm not sure what all that was about. He used to do his frets. I don't know, shave him down or something? I don't know. Anyway, because he played without a pick, which means he played with his fingers. Strange that all the people I seem to work with, well, most of the people I seem to work with, quite a lot of the people I seem to work with, who play guitar like Wilco Johnson and Tony McPhee played with their fingers without a pick. Hmm, is, does that mean something? I don't know. Anyway, I digress yet again. So anyway, we met and I agreed to do to be his agent, I think, at the time. And um, so it meant getting work. Now, at the time, he didn't want to do all what he was doing, the Groundhogs. There was a reason for this. He told me, I think, and I don't think he really meant this, but he said it was because he was scared of Will Pine, who was his manager, when he was in the Groundhogs. He was a bit of a gangster, and he owned the name or something. Of the family, the Englishman and the Mafia. And that was Will Pine. But, but he subsequently called himself the Groundhogs in later years. 
So I don't think that was really the main reason. I think it's because he wanted to do something new. Because the Groundhogs, now, strange it may seem, I was never a big fan of the hard rock sound of the Groundhogs because it was very loud, very in your face. It was fantastic stuff, don't get me wrong. I could see where the skill was, where the power was in this, this music, but it wasn't my style of music. I was much more into the blues, and I think, quite honestly, he wanted to move back into the blues. So I, what I can recall, because I say it's quite a long time ago, it's a bit hazy. I think his band at the time was called the Tony McPhee Band, or he was gonna form a band called the Tony McPhee Band. And then we had a chat about it, and to differentiate it from the Groundhog stuff and the Wilf Pine connection, I think he wanted to call it the Tony McPhee Blues Band, which we did. The, the name changed all the time. I mean, and so I booked him out of the Tony McPhee Blues Band, and I think to start with, he really wanted to avoid playing the Groundhog stuff, but of course he couldn't, because that's what people wanted to see. So he, I think he used to do Cherry Red, and a couple of other songs which are more bluesy from the Ground Dogs repertoire, but avoiding the, the harder, louder rock songs and playing more of the bluesy stuff. But of course, as time went on and everybody wanted him to play the, the Ground Dog songs, he, it just melted naturally into that. And the name changed a few times. As the name changed and the lineup changed, because it was basically him on guitar and vocals, someone else on bass and then drums. That was the classic lineup as with the Groundhogs. And there was occasionally another guitarist and there was occasionally a keyboard player, I recall, and occasionally other things. And then after he had his stroke in 2008, Joanna, who's his next wife, who's his final wife, his wife now, um, came along to sing the vocals because he couldn't sing anymore. And to start with, he couldn't play the um, guitar. I was running the cricketers down in South East London from 83 or something to 1990, dabbling with the Sir George Roby in Finsley Park, helping Malcolm and Joe up there and doing stuff like that. And the agency is all like, we're still sort of ticking along, but I was like mainly doing the cricketers. And so it meant that I wasn't really, and I think he went off and got another agent and stuff. I think I still got in work for a long time and I helped out where I could and stuff. When the Groundhog stopped, he seemed to have no money whatsoever because his house, his flat in um, Hackney was just like a small, tiny flat. It wasn't posh. He, and he basically had to work, as I say, at, for British Telecom to pay the rent, so there you go. It was a question of finding lots of work and at the time, I can't remember exactly what the figures were, but all these people who had been big, like I was, when I was an agent in the late 70s, I was handling people who had been very big, like Desmond Decker, Gina Washington Ram Jam Band, Tony McPhee, Wilco Johnson, who'd been in Dr. Feelgood. But the problem was, it was, they'd had their day sort of thing. So back then there was lots of gigs everywhere. People went to lots of gigs, but because there were lots of gigs, and there were lots of places to watch bands, mostly pubs and clubs that held between two and 400 people. The fees were quite low. I mean, Tony used to pull a lot of people and he could get like, I mean, on a good night. Well, this way, when I was doing the cricketers in the 80s, I used to be paying Steve Marriott, who was the lead and inspiration and the big guy behind the small faces. I was paying him a guarantee of sort of 400 pounds or 450 pounds. Gina Washington the same, 500 pounds maybe, as it went on and they got more and more thing. But that was quite a lot back then. They could pull probably two or 300 people paying. Then it was about three or four pounds to get in for the top end of the Obrock thing. And they used to be on 70 or 80% of the door, so you can work it out yourself. I'm not very really good at maths. Bear in mind that, like, these are people who, like, a few years before had been in the charts. Like, um, you know, I mean, Tony McPhee, the Ground Dogs, have been on top of the pops. The first iteration of the Ground Dogs, named after a John Lee Hooker song, in case you didn't know, actually backed John Lee Hooker. <laughs> I think he might have backed Halling Wolf once, but I'm not sure about that. But that was what he was into, that sort of music, and he literally, and he was big friends with John Lee Hooker, and like, so they used to actually, when they were on the road, they used to share the same van, they used to sit, which John Lee 
hooker is not known, especially in later life, for going out with the band. He used to like be the guy in being driven around in the car. But in those days, he used to enjoy being with the Groundhogs, and he obviously named them the Groundhogs. Then we drifted apart, he moved to Shropshire, and I haven't seen him for probably, I don't know, 20 years, maybe slightly less. But last time I put him on was at the was at the Rhythm Festival when it was at Twinwood Arena. I think it was about 2008, maybe, just before he had his stroke. Or might, no, he's after he had his stroke because Joanna, his wife, was actually singing because she took over the singing and he learned how to play the guitar again. That's right. And I remember we had the damned on and Captain Sensible insisted that the damned set didn't coincide with the Groundhog set because he wanted to rush over and in fact he guested with the Groundhogs and he was like a very big fan and they got on great and um, Tony was such a nice guy, he really was, he had horrible health issues, I don't know why because he looked after himself, he wasn't fat like me. I think it's just the way it goes isn't it, it's just a bit, uh, just a shame, poor guy, he was 79. I suppose he's a fairly good innings, but he'll be sadly missed. I wish I'd spent a bit more time um, t talking to him and and actually corresponding with him, especially towards the end of his life. Now, of course, it's t too late. R.I.P. Tony McPhee, the end of an era. Well, thank you for watching, and if you like it, please like, subscribe. I'm going to be back doing more. I've not done any videos for quite a long time, but I've been, um, well, I'll just tell you what I've been doing in my next video. Thanks for watching. See you next time. Goodbye.